Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, series, uh, which we are bringing to you on exploring science with the Shantiswaru Patnagar uh, Prize winners of this year. So today we are going to start with biological sciences. Uh, but before we start, I think it's a season of uh, prizes all over the world. We've been hearing about Nobel Prize announcements this year uh, in chemistry and biological sciences and so on. And uh, Shantiswaru Bhatnagar Awards are known as uh, India's equivalent of the Nobel Prizes. Uh, they're highly prestigious. And we are very happy to bring to you the uh, speakers today who are the awardee winners. And uh, just a brief recap of uh, Shantiswaru Bhatnagar. He was the founding father of CSIR. Um, and he actually went on to become the chairman of UGC. He had very important uh, positions and his contributions are legendary, both in applied sciences and biological science uh, and chemical sciences. And uh, so these awards are named after him, uh, the Shantiswaru uh, uh, Ratnagar Prizes. And the first one was in 1958. And uh, Dr. K.S. Krishnan received the first uh, Shantiswaru Ratnagar Prize. And biological sciences, it started in 1960. And uh, Dr. T. S. Uh, Sadashivan was the first uh, winner of the uh, Shantiswaru Patnagar Prize in 1960. Uh, so today we will uh, have two speakers, uh, Dr. Vatsala Tirumalai and Dr. Shivadi Chatterjee. Uh, but before we move on to them, I request uh, DGCSIR Dr. Shekhar Mande uh, to welcome both the speakers and give his opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Mande. Thank you, Geeta. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have both our Bhatnagar awardees here. Vatsala and Shubhadeep. Uh, before I start, hearty congratulations to both of you. Uh, this is uh, by far the most prestigious recognition in Indian science uh, in terms of its eminence and visibility and everything. So we are so proud of both of you for the contributions that you, both of you have made. Uh, as Gita correctly said, uh, CSIR started giving these awards in 1958. And since then, these awards have reached some sort of a cult status uh, across India. And as you would have noticed already, it changes your life uh, overnight. So you get, I mean, you would have received probably congressional calls from all over the places. And that's for good. And that's for good for science. It's also good for Indian uh, public in general, because uh, there's one way we uh, our science become very visible to the general public. And as Gita said, Almost entire uh, India's who is who in SNT has been uh, in the past a Bhatnagar awardee. So you name any uh, distinguished uh, scientist since 1958, and invariably he would have been a Bhatnagar awardee uh, in his or her time. Uh, it's great that both of you have been recognized for the effort that you have put in, and very deservingly so. We are very proud of uh, both of you for this. Now, one way of taking your science to general public is also to tell people what you have been doing and probably uh, in a language that people can also understand. So what I'm going to request both of you is uh, tell people what you have been doing and all of us uh, will be listening to you very intently. Uh, we are also going to have uh, the same seminar for uh, physics, chemistry and other things. As you are aware, a Bhatnagar award is given in seven different disciplines. And biological sciences is only one of them. But we are starting this uh, series, seminar series, with the biological sciences. Uh, I leave the floor to you. It's your day. Uh, please do tell us about your work, what you have been doing, in as simple a language as possible, and look forward to hearing from you. And congratulations again. Geeta, back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mande. And uh, uh, I will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Vatsala Tirumalai. Uh, a brief introduction to her. Uh, she has done a PhD in neurosciences from Brandeis University in the US. And after that, she did a postdoctoral work at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and also at the NIH. And then she joined NCBS in Bangalore and has been there ever since, I think, uh, carrying out her research in neurosciences. She has received many awards, of course, Patnagar Award, we all know. And uh, she's also received the Welcome Trust, CBT Alliance, Intermediate Fellowship, and Senior Fellowship. She's on the editorial board of many journals like eLife, Journal of Physiology, Journal of Neurophysiology. I'm not going to talk about her publications and research because she's precisely going to talk about the research. And um, as Dr. Mande said, outreach is an important component. And I'm happy to see that uh, uh, Dr. Vatsala has already been actually engaged in many outreach activities. She has given very popular lectures. And it's really nice to see that leading scientists taking time and reaching out to the public. 
and um, so over to you dr vatsada and congratulations again and uh, we look forward to hearing thank you uh, geeta thank you professor mande it is indeed an honor to be presenting my work in this uh, forum uh, so let me uh, go ahead and share my screen uh, and begin my presentation um can I, can can everyone see my screen is it visible yes we can see your screen uh, dr vatsala just go into the screen mode into the uh, presentation mode right okay um actually yeah so um no, you thank have to you go to presentation mode we can otherwise we can read your notes what you have prepared uh i have gone in presentation mode uh so slide show mode slide show mode so what you do is uh, come out of this uh, uh, slide share let okay. the, the slide show mode be on but just come out of the that cross that you see there you click on the cross for the slide show so in the ms teams you will see a cross you yeah. click on the cross yeah okay now once again share and then yeah. at that time share the full screen what you are doing slide share that up arrow in the rectangle you click on that again oh i see i have to go into presentation mode and then share it okay i got it okay uh, i don't know if that's going to work is that is that working no uh, yeah yes. okay it's again back to the same you have to go uh, to slide slide show um yes there's the one is that is that better do you mm. see it in the full screen now no not unfortunately uh so what happens is that if i okay let me try um okay let me try one more time or i'll just make the slides bigger that's maybe an easier way to do this because if i come um, i have to come out of the full screen mode to be able to share it and when i do that the full screen mode goes away so let after me just you, after you share also you can make it full screen mode you try that and see if i do that it doesn't show up on teams for whatever reason i don't know why or maybe i can share my desktop maybe that will work No, 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 no! Don't do it. Let us. You can go into the. Okay, let me just share it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now it should. Is that better? Yes. Yes. It's better. Ah. Yeah. Um. So today I'm going to talk about uh, or or offer a few glimpses into the work that we do in uh, my lab. Um. we are interested in understanding how the brain works um and so i'm going to tell you why i call it fishing expeditions in the brain now as we all know our brain is actually a universe inside of us uh in terms of its complexity just like in the universe there are billions and billions of stars uh the nervous system in humans con consists of 100 billion nerve cells or neurons and then there are several orders more synaptic connections between these neurons that makes it a truly complex organ within within the body but you know neuroscientists like me strive for an understanding of how the brain works at many levels because you know just like the universe the nervous system also is organized yet complex or complex yet organized the brain for example is organized starting from the molecular level which is the scale the spatial scale is shown here on the left hand side as you can see 10 to the power minus 10 meters so at that level at that spatial scale there are molecules like proteins and lipids and carbohydrates which are all organized within the nervous system to carry out specific functions 
Now, as you move up the spatial scale into nanometers, micrometers, millimeters, centimeters, and so on, you see organization at each of these levels. So the molecules in turn get organized into signaling networks. Signaling networks get organized into compartments within the cell like the nucleus or the dendrite or the axon or synapse. And then from the compartments, you get whole nerve cells or neurons. And these nerve cells or neurons make connections with each other and make circuits. If you look at the circuits within our brain, it resembles very much the printed circuit boards that you might see in electronics. And you know, much of the uh, work or the function that goes on within the nervous system is also similar to what a piece of printed circuit might be doing processing inputs and then generating outputs. And then these circuits in turn are organized towards specific functions such as our ability to see consists of several circuits, uh, our ability to sense smell, our ability to speak, our ability to move around. All of these are different systems within the nervous system. And then the ultimate output of all of this complexity is that you get behavior behavior uh, as you will see in humans or in animals uh, even the very simple life forms show behavior such as the fruit fly for instance shows very nice types of behavior that you can study now for a for a, um, a neuroscientist the challenge of course is that you have to be able to generate understanding at any of these levels and then translate it to what it means at a different level what do i mean by that so if you for example are studying some molecule within the uh, nervous system you have to be able to understand how that molecules finally impinges on behavior or the organism's ability to see smell move around etc etc right so how do we do that this is more easily said than done because um, you know not all model organisms lend themselves to studying questions at multiple levels so question in questions in neuroscience involve multiple scales as i have shown you and you need a good mo experimental model system in which you can go from one level of analysis to another and go back and forth like that so that you get an integrated understanding of how the brain works. So what we choose is the zebrafish as our model organism, hence fishing expeditions in the brain. Why zebrafish? Uh, first of all, you know, these are uh, for for um, uh, a country like India, these are model organisms that you can keep and grow and uh, work on um, at relatively less expenditure. Large numbers can be kept in the lab and it doesn't cost much to have a zebrafish uh, facility. Uh, but more than the economic aspect of this, there are several other experimental advantages. Number one being that in the um, in this is the zebrafish uh, adult um, and the adult lays eggs. The eggs are completely transparent and the animals continue to be transparent all the way up to about 10 days, 12 days post fertilization means after the egg was laid. Okay, up, up until about 10 12 days you can see through the organism here is an example this is a seven day post fertilization larva and the brain is somewhere over here this is the eye and then the spinal cord is all along here so and and then you can see the muscle stripes over there if you squint a little bit so you're able to see the nervous system as the animal is doing several things through development so you can ask how the brain is forming and how these neurons function the other added advantage of this animal is that because it is transparent you can put in fluorescent markers like shown here here is a single neuron that expresses a fluorescent protein uh, green fluorescent protein gfp if some of you know it you can also put in calcium sensors to measure activity so it's not just a pretty label but you can also read function from such uh, genetic labels so these are some of the advantages of working with zebrafish um, of course as i uh, promised you earlier you can also jump across scales you can manipulate single molecules and then you can take it to the behavior of the larva what kind of behavior are we talking about so fish unlike humans don't take care of their young um, after they lay their eggs they just lay their eggs and go away sometimes they may even eat them um, 
these organisms when they hatch they have a little bit of yolk in them to sustain them until about 3 4 days uh, post fertilization but after that they have to hunt they have to avoid predators um, and generally they have to take care of themselves so for a lab that's studying uh, movement this is a uh, very big advantage so that is that brings me to the big question that we study in the lab which is how does the brain generate movement that is what we are interested in why are we interested in this question because it's one of the most basic functions of the brain any um, animal that you see around it has to be able to move to find food to find reproductive partners to escape predators and so on so if it's not able to move then it's pretty much survival its survival becomes uh, questionable right so that is what we study in the lab we ask what are the different parts of the brain involved in movement what specific aspects of movement are these uh, brain circuits encoding so i'll i'll talk about two major stories um, today so number 1 i will talk about how do animals control their speed when animals are moving about speed regulation is an important aspect of their movement and this is graduate thesis work that was done by a brilliant graduate student in the lab ms urvashi ja she is going to be finishing soon um so why do animals need to regulate speed number 1 as i told you you have to be able to um regulate speed to find food or to escape predators um now here is a video of a cheetah chasing antelope now if the either you run fast to ca catch lunch for yourself or you become lunch for the predator so it's a question of both survival for both the cheetah as well as the antelope so um this is one important uh, function of speed regulation in the nervous system of course as i said you also need to regulate speed uh, to be able to find reproductive partners now this uh, is a famous movie clip that many of you might have seen and as you can see you know to find her romantic partner she has to uh, run as fast as the train so this is one example for how speed regulation is important for reproductive success in the animal kingdom now of course the human beings are perhaps unique uh, because they run for vanity they can run to win just a shiny piece of medal uh, here is an olympic running race with usain bolt and uh, you know as you can see speed which is uh, finely regulated results in usain bolt winning uh, and the error of uh, margin of error can be sometimes in the range of milliseconds right uh lastly i want to leave you with this video where it's not even for winning a shiny piece of medal but uh it's for catching it on camera which many of us do these days in trying to get selfies and so on we regulate our speeds to catch the best moments on camera but jokes aside let's see what do we know about uh, speed control thus far in neurobiology of course there are several people who have worked before me in this field and they've uh, figured out a lot of things what we know broadly is that there are regions in the brain such as the motor cortex the basal ganglia and the cerebellum that select an action at any moment you know you receive lots of different inputs and you have to decide what to do i have to decide for example if i have to continue talking if i have to be sitting here or um if i have to uh, you know get up and drink water so on and so forth i may not choose to go get up and drink water right now even though if i uh, i'm i'm feeling thirsty right so at any moment the brain needs to make a decision on on what it needs to do and once a decision has been made uh, if a movement is involved then it has to plan it for example um if if there is a lunch lying at a table away from you if you're very hungry you may run towards it uh, if you're not so hungry you may walk towards it um and if you're not at all feeling very um hungry you may choose not to go there at all right so you need to plan your course of action after you've decided what action you're going to do and once all of these details have been worked out then uh, the brain issues commands 
uh, in the form of electrical signals and it activates a certain midbrain region called the mesencephalic locomotor region. The name itself is not so important right now, but what this region does is that it sends commands at various frequencies. So for very slow walking, for example, it may send uh, signals which are at low frequency like this and at very far, far for very fast locomotion like running, it may send fast frequency signals. And also what it does is that depending on the speed and the intensity of locomotion, it engages gears in the spinal cord. This may surprise some of you that there are gears in spinal cord, but this is what research shows that there are in fact speed modules within the spinal cord. There are some neurons, nerve cell types which get activated preferentially do during slow movements and there are some uh, circuits that get activated preferentially do it during fast movements and so on. And, and so it is the job of this midbrain region to select these gears and then tell them that, you know, this is what you have to do right now. I'm going to tell you to uh, walk at this speed or run at this speed and so on and so forth. And then those gears in the spinal cord talk to this cell type called the motor neuron and the motor neuron instructs the muscles then to uh, do their job which is to walk or run but in this schema then what the field thought was that speed was something that was set by all these pre-motor circuits up in the brain and that the motor neurons themselves were slaves and had to do what was told to them now our work so shows that that is in not uh, the case. This is not the complete story. So before I go further ahead, I will show a lot of different things and I want to make sure that I take everybody along with me. I will show signals like this. As you know, uh, the nerve cells or neurons signal using electricity. And so many of our assays involve measuring the electrical signals within the brain. When I show something like these, these little spiky things are actually spikes or action potentials. They are voltage signals, increase um, or, or depolarizations in the voltage of the uh, membrane potential of the neuron and the x-axis is time. So you can see the time basis is in milliseconds. So these are in, in fact very, very far, fast signals. Um, and these action potentials, every action potential will cause the animal to contract its muscle and result in movement. So the more there are number of action potentials, the more muscle contraction there will be and therefore the higher the force of the movement. OK. So what we found was that if you place larvae in a dish uh, with water, normal water, they will swim around at a certain speed. We show them these black and white radial gratings uh, to induce swimming in these larvae. You can see that in the background. When we put a drug that activates dopamine receptors, we find that the larva swims much faster. So you can compare the left and the right and you can see that the uh, larva is swimming much faster when there is dopamine uh, D1 receptor in activating drug in the medium. So we wanted to understand how is it that when all else remains the same, just activation of dopamine receptors makes the fish swim faster. So for that, we did another experiment where we uh, put the fish in a jelly-like medium the head was uh, stuck in this jelly-like medium and the tail was free to move. And you can see that the tail bends much more in the presence of the dopaminergic drug. So this is agonist is dopamine receptor activating drug. And the tip of the tail, if you watch, the tip of the tail is moving over a larger extent compared to when the animal was in normal saline, right? Um, so how is that possible? How is it that this um, larva bends its tail much more in the presence of this drug compared to in normal water. To do that, we resorted to recording the swim commands. And the way you can do that is again, put the fish in a dish, you paralyze the larva, so there is no movement actually, but the spinal cord continues to issue swim commands. And you can put an electrode against the spinal cord or the muscle and you can record these signals extracellularly. And here is what we see. Uh, so when we show the gratings and the grating move forwards, forward, then you see these swim bouts, these vertical bars are uh, electrical commands underlying every single swimming bout of the fish larva. 
Now we place the same larva in uh, water containing the D1-like receptor agonist and you see that the signals are much, much bigger, right? Um, I will show you here in greater expanded time base. So this is the swim command that you see in normal water and this is the swim command that you see when the dopamine-like drug is added. Um, and this shows that the size of the signals is much more. Notice that the frequency of the commands is the same, roughly about uh, in the time span of this recording, you see five uh, bursts of swimming, six bursts of swimming here and six bursts of swimming there. The frequency has not changed, but the amplitude of these signals has increased. The only way that the amplitude can change without change in frequency is if there are changes at the level of the motor neuron, if there are more, more of these motor neurons being activated. So we wanted to check whether that was true. And what we did was we recorded from single motor neurons within the spinal cord. That's what this red rectangle shows. Again, this is a paralyzed larva. We show the gratings to induce the swimming and then we record from these single neurons and we see that there are some neurons which are producing these action potentials or spikes, which are these tall things here. Those are the action potentials. The small things are synaptic inputs. We'll not worry about them right now. But you see that when the drug is put, then this neuron is making many, many more action potentials in the presence of the drug. Now, there are some neurons which were completely silent in the normal saline, but now when we put the drug on, even those neurons which were completely silent have started to produce action potentials. So that is true um, if you look in the expanded time base again, that there are many, many more action potentials within the motor neuron when the drug is put in the bath. So how is this um, happening? How is it that the motor neuron is able to produce many, many more spikes? Um, so neurons are actually like uh, integrators. They integrate the input that comes into them and then they produce these voltage outputs in the form of action potentials. We asked whether the input output transform of the motor neuron has changed and indeed it has. So we just injected current steps. These are current steps here in the bottom. And this is the voltage response of the cell. And you can see in the normal saline, in the wa normal water, the neuron is only making two action potentials. But for the same amount of current, when the dopaminergic drug is present, then it makes many, many more action potentials. This shows that at the level of the single motor neuron, it is able to transform the same given input to a larger output and that's how the tail is able to bend more and then uh, animal is able to swim forward at a faster speed. So this is the summary for this part. Um, so what we already know was that brain commands can regulate speed in the form of modulation of frequency. But we showed that even after the frequency is set, there can be neuromodulation at the level of the motor neuron to modulate the amplitude increase amplitude in terms of having more action potentials at the level of the motor neuron and increase speed. So this work is published and uh, you can look up this paper if you're interested in more details. Now, um, I hope I have a little bit more time. Um, I can talk about the second uh, part of this uh, work, um, which is has to do with the cerebellum and this again is work done by two brilliant graduate students in the lab, Mohini Sengupta who has graduated and gone on to the US for postdoc and Sriram Narayanan who is also going to graduate soon. So the cerebellum is a leaf like um, organ at the base of the brain and the fish also has a cerebellum. It's one of evolutionarily one of the oldest parts of the brain. So the organization of the cerebellum in fish is very similar to the organization of cerebellum in humans. And so it makes sense to study how this organ functions in fish and use it as a model for human cerebellar function. Again, we can monitor the activity of single neurons within the cerebellum of live larvae. Uh, here is an, uh, an electrode, a patch pipette loaded with dye, and we are patching onto a single Purkinje neuron, which is the main neuronal cell type in the cerebellum. And uh, we can ask what is the activity of this neuron when the fish is going about its business doing uh, swims uh, in the water, not uh, really free swims, but fictive swims like I showed you before uh, by monitoring the swim commands that come from the spinal cord. 
so when we recorded from these neurons what we found to our great surprise was that these neurons can actually talk in two languages um, what we call as up and down states because of the membrane potential at which these signals occur at a very high uh, uh, hyperpolarized uh, membrane potential you see that the neuron is making what are, what are called these bursts of action potentials these things here on top uh, these are called the action potentials as i told you before and these occur as you see in bursts but when the neuron is at a different membrane potential uh, around minus 40 millivolts then it produces these action potentials these are the things over here and they occur at a much more regular pace so you can think of it as a humming um, pattern versus a beating pattern sort of like a drum beat over here in the down state and sort of like a constant uh, hum at the up state why is this important why should it matter whether the Purkinje neuron is in the up or the down state, whether it's beating or humming? So to understand the meaning of these signals for the fish, we again monitored the activity of the Purkinje neuron simultaneously with the swim commands like I told you before. So each of these things again is a swim bout. It corresponds to swimming in the zebra fish. And we ask, OK, when, the, when there was a swim command, what was this Purkinje neuron doing? And again, we found a very, very surprising result, which is that the spike syllables are translated to different meanings in terms of the swims. When the Purkinje neuron was in the down state, every burst or every beat was accompanied by a swim bout. You can see that, right? Every burst has a swim bout. But we can put this Purkinje neuron in the up state by injecting current into it. So this is in fact the very same neuron and the very same neuron when it's put at a different membrane potential and it's in this humming mode, the hums are no longer associated with the swim commands. It seems as if the swim bouts are disengaged from the what this particular Purkinje neuron is doing. So this tells us that the Purkinje neuron can use these two states, the two languages to engage or disengage with what is happening in the motor world. Whether the fish is swimming or not, the per single Purkinje neuron can decide to opt in and out of listening to what is happening in the periphery. Um, so we also wanted to be that as it may, what the single neuron is doing. It's also important to find out what all Purkinje neurons are doing to get a more complete picture of what the cerebellum is doing. And for that, what we did was we built uh, a custom two photon microscope, which allows us to look into the brain of the larva while it is engaged in behavior. So there is a screen which shows these grating patterns to induce swimming, like I told you before. And there is an objective which shines infrared light into the brain of the larva to image activity. And then we also uh, can image the activity of Purkinje neurons using these um, using these um, uh, calcium sensors which are genetically expressed. So in this video, for instance, you can see that there is a camera looking at what the tail is doing over here. And there are uh, there is uh, a way to image the brain, which is the cerebellum part only here. And every time a neuron becomes active, it flashes. There is an increase in uh, fluorescence of the Purkinje neuron and we can quantify these activity patterns. So these traces on the right hand side are actually the fluorescence increases as the fish is doing a swim bout, right? So these are every row is a Purkinje neuron. So at a time we've been able to collect 60 to 80 Purkinje neurons and, and ask what they are doing. And using this, what we have figured out is that the activity in the Purkinje neurons help the larva respond faster to expected stimuli. So what uh, we did was show repetitive uh, blocks of flow stimuli. So you see this trace up there. The every single upward swing denotes that the flow was turned on. The grating was moving in these parts of the trace. And then the grating becomes stationary. The black and white pattern becomes stationary. And we do this for uh, many trials and then we suddenly stop. And what we found was that after 
a few trials, the fish begins to expect these repetitive flow on stimuli and the activity in the Purkinje neuron actually predicts the time of occurrence of the repetitive stimuli. And there are some Purkinje neurons which are not active when the flow is given, but when the flow is turned off, they report an error. So these are Purkinje neurons that are sh showing that listen, I, I, I was seeing these repetitive stimuli and suddenly those stimuli stopped and those stimuli were supposed to come at the time of peak of these error signals, right? So there are both sets of Purkinje neurons. There are one sets of Purkinje neurons which learn the pattern and there are another set of Purkinje neurons that report an error if that pattern is not followed. And what we figured out was that the latency, which is the time difference between when the flow turns on, to when the fish produces a swim um, is inversely correlated with the uh, uh, strength of this signal. That means that, you know, if the fish learnt this pattern very well, then it responds with very, very low latency. And if the uh, fish did not learn the pattern very well, then it responds with a la longer latency. It takes longer to generate a swim. So these Purkinje neurons learn these repetitive stimuli and begin to um, tune the response of the fish uh, uh, as, as it learns these uh, stimuli. So this is important because in our environment also there are lots of uh, uh, you know visual maybe or auditory uh, stimuli that come repeatedly and we need to learn to tune our responses so that we respond better and better and better as the response as the uh, stimuli are presented to us again and again right uh, sort of like tapping your feet, learning a dance step, all of those things will come under this purview. And the Purkinje neurons do in fact have a lot to do with motor learning, uh, such as learning to play a piano, learning basketball, uh, becoming a good tennis player, all of those things. And it has to do with the Purkinje neurons role in making that the responses are happening faster in time, quicker in time in this latency modulation. So that is something that uh, we have uh, showed. So to summarize my talk, I will say that I have shown you that in the cerebellum, Purkinje neurons change the mode in which they are firing and alter their relationship to the swimming. I also showed you that the, the responses of the Purkinje neurons themselves are uh, related to how fast the fish is able to respond. And in the spinal cord, I've showed you that single motor neurons change their activity when dopamine is present in order to increase the speed of movement. And these studies, um, unifyingly, they show that even though we may have, you know, 100 billion neurons in our brain, every single neuron is computationally very, very um, advanced. It has the computational power to alter outcomes for the entire organism. So I will uh, stop there with thanks to my group. I have a wonderful set of colleagues uh, here in NCBS, uh, supportive environment from facilities. Uh, we have a wonderful daycare, which has allowed me to concentrate on the science. Um, I, I thank all of the facilities at uh, NCBS, uh, TIFR, and also the funding uh, agencies, uh, mainly Welcome Trust, DBT India Alliance, DA. DAE and uh, SCRB, DBT, all of these agencies have funded our work throughout the uh, years that have been here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vatsula. Uh, you can stop sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a really fascinating talk. And uh, we have some questions from the audience, but we'll take it at the end of uh, Dr. Shubhadi's talk also. Thank you again for really the fascinating journey and the DDLG movie scene will always remain with me. <laughs> Good art of communication. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Shubhadeep Chatterjee, who is the other uh, awardee of the Shanti Swaru Patnagar Prize. Uh, Dr. Shubhadeep Chatterjee is a scientist at uh, CDFT. Uh, Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. He has uh, obtained his PhD from Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in 2004. Uh, and after that, he worked briefly at uh, Shantini Ketan as an assistant professor. Then he went on to do his postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley. 
and then he moved back and joined as a staff scientist in CDFD and has been working there ever since from 2008 onwards. And uh, he's also received many awards, uh, such as the National Bioscience Award for Career Development from DBT. And he has also received the Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award. And of course, he's a member of many National Academy of Sciences and uh, other awards have come along his way. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Shubhadeep Chatterjee to give us a uh, Take, take us through the journey of his work and uh, congratulations, Dr. Shubhadi, for receiving the prize. Uh, over to you. So, shall I first share my slides? Yes, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. I think you have to come up. Shubhadi, do you want me to share or you will share? Uh, you can you can share you can share uh, dr shubhadeep you keep your video on yeah 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 we can see your slides are visible i hope you yeah. can see them too. yeah okay over to you so uh, so first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, dr shekhar mande BGCSR for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, and uh, Dr. Gita. So, so, so what I will be doing in the 25 minutes or so is to give you a uh, glimpse of uh, one of the major interests in our lab, which is to understand the social language of bacteria, like how microbes can speak with each other and uh, and sometimes they cheat so, so they don't speak so it's a very fascinating subject so in that uh, this talk actually i have divided into three parts so first i will introduce you to cell cell communication in bacteria and uh, in the second part we will talk about the language of the of the of the of bacteria and then we will discuss very briefly about the quantum sensing uh, system in bacteria so in my talk i will present no data so all uh, like only one slide might be there so so as you see uh, response by communication is one of the key feature of all living organism so a response by communication, any means of communication is very important for uh, for uh, for a living organism to respond to change in environmental condition. So, can I go to next slide? So, the communication or language, as I've seen in nature, that uh, firefly go blows, honeybees dance. And there are many animals which secretia only takes place at least early in the late 90s, uh, 1990s. So, uh, that so they added the supernatant from a highly communicating bacteria to no communicating bacteria. And they found that low communicating bacteria communicates. They emit light. The first clue came that there is some chemical molecules which might be there secreted by the highly communicating bacteria, which makes the communication possible. Can I go to the next slide? Then the whole field of social microbiology came that bacteria were no longer considered nowadays as a solitary organism. They often form large colonies or communities, which are called a bio. density dependent fashion and then there is a complex communication so imagine this is a barrier which this bacteria has to cross if it fires bullets individually the barrier may not break but if it fires bullet together there will be lots of bullets and it will make a barrier very similar to infection 
see large amount of communicating bacteria. Can I go to the next slide? Next slide, please. So I am not going into the signaling system, but what uh, what we worked already in our lab. So there is a cartoon depicting uh, this. It's a very complex system. What I give to the take home message is they use a very complex and sophisticated information processing system uh, by quorum sensing to perform tasks. So the bacteria is always thinking and processing the information of how the, how many they are. And based on that, it is drastically affecting the gene regulatory circuit. So we are still trying to dissect out more components in this uh, pathway. So we could understand from our work that how Xanthomonas use this 